From Kona to Yanan, The Political Memoirs of Koji Ariyoshi, Chapter 17. Afterward, in the heat of revolutionary upsurge, the founders of our nation wrote in the Declaration of Independence, July 4, 1776, that prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes and accordingly all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed but when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism it is their right it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security in the present situation who is guilty of progressively undermining the people's confidence in government is it the truman administration which is riddled by graft and corruption and which is giving at best poor leadership or is it people like me who raise our voices against such graft and corruption and constantly remind the administration of its nineteen forty eight campaign promises to extend civil rights repeal of the taft hartley law etc all of which were thrown overboard to satisfy dixiecrats and the reactionary republicans and to win their support for a war program when menacing recession and unemployment frightened the incompetent administration nothing more clearly destroys the confidence of people in government than bad leadership recognizing this the architects of our nation wrote in the declaration of independence whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends securing of life liberty and the pursuit of happiness by the people it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness the language here is very clear i have not said as much in the editorial columns of the honolulu record the medium of my communication with the reading public but i am charged with advocating the violent overthrow of the government is the fight against discrimination because of color religion or belief against abuses of laborers colonialism and subjugation of hundreds of millions or the struggle for civil liberties and for a sane and peaceful world destructive of our government only a government which is for big business which neglects and ignores civil liberties particularly for non-whites is for perpetuating colonialism and is for a war program would label such pursuits dangerous to itself the ideas which i possess and for which i now stand indicted under the smith act became a part of me as the result of my observations and experiences here in this country i am not charged with any overt act of crime but for my ideas which attorney general mcgrath seeks to lock behind bars many times in the history of our country dominant bigoted elements have whipped up hysteria to stifle the thinking and behavior of the vast populace fear stalked the land then a country proud of its democratic heritage as nonconformists were arrested and thrown in jail all in the attempt by the ruling elements to quash criticism and control the thoughts of the people such was the time of the alien and sedition acts when thomas jefferson himself was labeled a foreign agent a great democratic movement was shaking france then as the rising capitalist class took over the government from the feudal nobility such also was the time after the first world war when the palmer raids were conducted by g-men and jails were crowded especially in the eastern states a great revolution was going on in europe particularly in russia where the tsarist government was removed and replaced by a government of workers peasants and intellectuals here too feudalism was wiped away and the soviet union moved to socialism in the spring of nineteen forty two when one hundred ten thousand of us all of japanese ancestry were put behind barbed wire and watch towers we were not charged with any overt act of crime against the united states this was another period of hysteria within our country when so many of us were summarily locked away and for what at that time the dominant racists and vested interests who wanted to grab hold of alien and japanese american property and businesses made it appear that we were dangerous and so many americans came to believe this such also is the present period following world war two which awakened the consciousness of colonial peoples for independence and a better life of decency equality and human respect many nations participated in the struggle against the axis powers and the colonial and semi-colonial people who took up arms on our side learned to fight against imperialism while they resisted japanese or german imperialism during the war when the war was over they resisted in like manner the return of the british or dutch or french rulers to again exploit them and the natural resources of their land as supreme court justice douglas and many others prominent in our country have said this is a period of great social revolution today imperialism is at the twilight stage korea indochina malaya iran and the present conflict in egypt are all part and parcel of the struggle of a billion colonial or semi-colonial people for control over their own lives and today there is hysteria again in our great country of democratic traditions which grew out of a revolution to free people of the thirteen colonies from despotic british rule 
because our country grew out of such a struggle for freedom, and because the movement for liberation inspired under Roosevelt's administration, particularly during World War II, it was natural for colonial people to look to the United States for support in freeing themselves from British, French, or Dutch rule after the war. But the leaders of our nation, the dominant business and financial groups and their errand boys in government, are interested in the natural resources and cheap labor of the colonies and semi-colonies controlled by Britain, France, and the Netherlands. If the people become free and independent, the profiteering would end, such as the threatening condition in oil-rich Iran today or rubber-rich Malay. To keep down or destroy the aspirations of these freedom-seeking people, the imperialist powers use force against them. Thus, today imperialism means war, and freedom and development of colonial areas means peace. In such a time it is very unpopular to speak out for peace. Now, as during the period of the Alien and Sedition Acts and the Palmer Raids, fear stalks the land again. People who do not conform to the Cold War, contain communism way of thinking are arrested and jailed. The constitutional right for bail is even denied, as in the case of 15 Smith Act victims in Los Angeles. These arrests are only the beginning of further mass arrests if they are not stopped by an aroused populace. None of the numerous Smith Act victims are charged with any overt act against the country. But their arrests and trials are employed to silence opposition to the unpopular war program and to whip up war sentiment, something which is essential to continue the emergency economy that brings high profits to the big industrialists and financiers. And in order to create such a hysterical atmosphere, the propaganda is directed against the Soviet Union, communism, and socialism. Today, on a national scale, the red issue is being used to split major unions. The Truman administration, which is masterminded by representatives of big business, has played a major role in splitting the CIO, Congress of Industrial Organizations. The left-wing unions were expelled because they refused to support the Democratic Party or the administration's foreign policy, or both. The CIO and the AFL, American Federation of Labor, worried about a depression, went along with the war program. And in doing so, they have helped to keep the Taft-Hartley law on the books, an anti-labor legislation which President Truman himself denounced as a slave labor law but a weapon he has already used nine times to break strikes. Today, after a few years of the war program, more and more of the rank-and-file workers complain of higher taxes and higher prices, and they want peace. They are appalled by the corruption among Democratic Party officials to whom their leaders have latched their unions. Thus it becomes a conspiracy against the big business captured government for anyone to call for peace. Harry Bridges was thrown in jail last year for advocating peaceful settlement of the Korean War. The mass protest of Hawaiian sugar workers greatly influenced his release from prison. In various ways I hear people ask, what is wrong? There is something gravely wrong when our government functions best when it is producing to destroy mankind and the goods they create. Today, the FBI and the Justice Department harassment is directed against advocates of peace when our country is spending 88 cents out of every dollar for war and war preparation against communists and those suspected of being communists. But the system of subversive listing to keep people frightened and in line, like Jim Crowism, hits all minorities. One persecutes on the ideological and even religious level, while the other works on the color line. I received my university education during the period when the political climate in our country was liberal. I remember reading Clifford Audit's play, Waiting for Lefty, in one of my English classes during the late 30s at the University of Hawaii. Audits then had his feet on the ground, felt the pulsation of the broad masses of Americans about whom he wrote as a WPA playwright, and moved in the cultural mainstream of the New Deal decade. Two weeks ago, May 1952, he crawled before the Un-American Committee in the nation's capital. He probably recants that he ever wrote a play such as Waiting for Leffy about 20 years ago, the play that brought him national fame as a progressive playwright. And that means an apology that he ever had interest in the people's aspiration for a better life, human decency, and respect. And that is to swallow his words of 1949 when he vigorously defended the top U.S. communist leaders when they were on trial under the Smith Act. In this period of belly-crawling acts before racists like Senator Pat McCarran and Congressman John S. Wood of Georgia, both of whom run the un-American show in the upper and lower houses of Congress, I wonder how many university professors can discuss waiting for Lefty in its proper setting. It is a play written during the Depression years when the communists and militant progressives gave leadership in organizing trade unions. This is history, but can a faculty member discuss this with students at a time when the Territorial Department of Public Instruction discourages the students from reading important selections from the works of Jefferson, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Thoreau, Frederick Douglass, and others? A witch hunt is like a contagious disease that eats away the tissues of good sense and fair play, leaving behind ugly and dangerous sores of prejudice, hatred, and or paralyzing fear. 
a witch hunt softens a great many individuals by gnawing at their innards and tearing at their guts it becomes in an atmosphere of fear and hysteria a vicious weapon of despots and the unscrupulous a witch hunt weakens the intellectual moral and creative fiber of the nation's people it not only makes people distrust one another but leaves a populace appallingly ignorant of world events which in these times of great social changes it is intended to do therefore to-day when approximately half the world lives by marxian philosophy and other parts are influenced by it in this nation of democratic tradition we experience intimidation persecution and thought control from cultural workers the artists and the writers who popularize ideas bread and butter is taken away if they do not conform so we have giants of our nation's cultural movement like paul robeson barred from the concert stage going to the people singing to them and talking to them and awakening their conscience and encouraging them to fight for freedom and peace all the books i have read are sold in the open market and stacked on library shelves the other day i took down a few books from the shelves of a public library in the courts i noted that books like these are on trial for the first time in our nation's history so now it has come to the point where the local post office is quietly burning incoming issues of the china monthly review a magazine published in shanghai by american-born william powell a graduate of the university of missouri school of journalism and a son of a well-known newspaperman with an extensive background in the far east this magazine has prestige numerous experts and students of far eastern affairs subscribe to it the periodical is found on the shelves of numerous libraries the postmaster has been acting under orders of the solicitor of the u s postal department evidently those behind this book burning policy do not want the people of this country to know what is actually taking place in china the china monthly review carries articles on reconstruction and rehabilitation programs it describes the peace sentiment of the chinese and it has been critical of u s military intervention in korea it has shown that despite the u s embargo against china that country has been spurting ahead in economic development it has given statistics on the increase in the number of schools teachers and students on new housing development and on the increase in production of consumer goods the stopping of the review is intended to keep americans ignorant about china while at the same time our official government and the vested interest propagandists who constantly yell about the bamboo curtain speak and write of chinese imperialism they want the people here to believe that china wants to conquer asia hard-hitting magazines like the review frustrate their stratagem and bring information to americans that the chinese do not want war but peace what the u s authorities are doing follows the pattern of chiang kai-shek's behavior chiang slapped a blockade against yan'an during the last war his propagandists then told the world that yan'an drunk people in its territory with opium ran slave labor camps and was making deals with the japanese invaders free trade and coexistence are the basis for peace recently i read of speeches being made on the pacific coast by miss maud russell for twenty years a ywca worker in china she is speaking out against embargo and for china trade which would mean two million jobs for u s workers that do not depend on a war economy a few people representing vested interests are telling the whole populace what to read and what not to read a whole nation is being insulted and intimidated scientists and scholars are frightened by bigoted demagogic politicians why are books on trial now books of twenty forty and one hundred years ago why have they become dangerous and subversive now this thought control is an admission of weakness in the competition of ideas not many years ago we were told in school that freedom of thought was an american virtue today this boast cannot be made an objective scientific and thorough examination of books and their contents is desirable the american people are capable of doing this and seeing what thoughts the books contain rather than being permitted to do this people in this country are being chased away from the free marketplace of ideas this weakens the moral and intellectual fiber of a nation if anyone is subverting free enterprise it is no one else but its guardians actually their method of defense is a subversion abroad thinking people regard free enterprise as western imperialism and by thinking people i do not mean mere scholars and businessmen but hundreds of millions of workers and peasants they do not want wars of capitalist competition of foreign domination and they are fortifying their thinking in their marketplace of ideas their thinking is militant at home books are put on trial to impress people that nonconformity is dangerous books are being taken off library shelves and who knows but what a dossier is being kept of people reading certain books in the library this is not surprising in a political climate where thought control federal police the fbi open private letters tap telephones and bud people's homes the people's inviolable castles but it is not in the cards that the american people should be regimented and pushed around in this manner 
If they allow it to continue, it will mean more war spending, more Koreas, and a world holocaust. When I was going through the books in the library, I recalled how impressed we were as children to hear that Abraham Lincoln walked miles to borrow books which he read by the light of burning logs. Lincoln was not afraid of ideas. He corresponded with workers of London led by Karl Marx himself, and personally promoted Joseph Wedemeyer, a known communist, from a colonel to a general in the Union Army. Of course, we never read these historical facts in school. Either our teachers kept this information from us or they themselves did not know about it. I believe the latter is more likely and, this being the case, now knowing that communism and communists were on the American scene a hundred years ago, they scurry for cover at the least bit of red baiting and talk of subversive foreign ideology. They should know that about a hundred years ago a United States Congress invited a utopian socialist, Robert Owen, to speak to that body to keep the minds of the people from anti-war thinking, liberal and progressive and Marxist influences, thought control laws are invoked. They are unable, however, to cope with the advancement in thinking in the non-white world, where the method of orderly and scientific approach and analysis of world problems is deepening its roots. People abroad are grappling with ideas, new ideas, just as the founders of this nation did in ending British domination of their lives in the 1770s. So many of us who have been brought up with the idea of Western superiority think in terms of the West doing this and that for Asians or people of other economically backward areas. And while we should know better or feel that we do, we are often surprised to discover that we harbor thoughts which we had consciously tried to get rid of. We cannot bring basic changes in the economy and social conditions in foreign countries. This the people there will bring about, and we can only support them, and no more. By the same token, people or powers from the outside cannot keep changes from taking place in a country indefinitely, for the very act of resisting such a change for the better would intensify the struggle to bring improvements. Today in the colonial, semi-colonial, and economically less developed areas, we find people with a new consciousness for human decency, self-respect, and independence, and they cannot be pushed around. In a way, the struggle of the peasants to own the land they till is like the struggle of workers in this country to organize unions for collective bargaining. One pertains to an agricultural society and the other to the industrial. One has landlords, the other has industrialists. Workers, as in Hawaii, quickly spot anti-union activities. In the same way, peasants and their allies in Asia notice unfriendly acts against them. One group calls his interest pork chop, the other a full rice bowl and human dignity. I feel that human decency and respect everywhere, among all people, will come when man's exploitation of man ends everywhere. When we stop sending arms to foreign countries to keep people divided and fighting among themselves so that they continue to be weak and always ripe for exploitation. And when human lives in Asia or Africa are not regarded as cheap, and we realize that all people are the same under the skin. I spent the past weekend, September 1952, in the Pune district, where I had lived a couple of my most important formative years. I visited Pahoa, where I met old friends and made new ones. I was happy to see the people more prosperous and independent. It hurt me, however, to see workers and their families living in the same old plantation houses, unattractive and dilapidated on the outside. What a contrast it is to see and feel the warm and home-like atmosphere inside these shacks to which the workers return after a hard day's labor. And what a contrast these houses are to the mansion in which manager Frank Burns lives. I was told Burns remarked that he doesn't care to live in his stable, which is too big and too troublesome to clean. The manager's stable is a huge building, standing high, with a new coat of paint, within a spacious, needy kept lawn. Manager Burns would rather have, the talk goes, a more compact, modern type house. His house is a carryover from the old days when the plantation bosses felt like kings among slaves. Manager Burns, of course, would not put up his family in houses the like of which you find in camps two or six at Pahoa, or at eight and a half mile or nine and a half mile at Ola'a. The change in the outlook and attitude of people, for example at Pahoa, gave me encouragement and happiness. I met old friends like Estanislao Galapon and Antonio Agmata, whom I knew 20 years ago. I was then a store clerk in Pahoa, and I noticed they bought eggplant, beans, onions, and bagum during the off-season. They had no choice but to buy the cheapest food that would fill their stomachs. Then when cutting season came around, they bought eggs and meat, but sparingly. Today, the workers are freer to the extent that they have more money to spend for food, household needs, clothing or entertainment. And you hear them talk of their union. Daniel Gallardo, of Camp 2, Pahoa, is still a most friendly and thoughtful person, and he has grown tremendously in stature through his participation in the union. I remember delivering kerosene, rice, and food packages to his room in the barracks-like camp house. He used to ask me how much I made on the W.P.A. project where I worked part-time about 30 hours a week. When I said I made more than twice his pay, he used to shake his head. 
He worked harder than I did and was exhausted at the end of the day, but the idea of a union to elevate living standards never entered our discussion two decades ago. Twenty years ago, the president of the Hawaiian Sugar Planters Association was saying that laborers imported from the Orient were no different from jute bags brought from India in which to sack sugar. Common workers were regarded as lowly creatures then. Today, the workers have won dignity, respect, and decency, and their social outlook has changed. The conduct and attitude of employers have helped to bring about this change. Older Filipinos, Japanese and Portuguese, and the younger elements are closely knit, and they have battered down the artificial dividing wall of suspicion and disunity put up by the employers. And you hear workers speak of the Filipino brother and not Bayao, which was used in former times. The union has eliminated to a large extent the poison of prejudice and hate instilled by the employers. How strong are people united to improve their living standards and to win independence and human decency? Now the Un-American Activities Committee is on the run. In Chicago it packed up and scuttled back to Washington after three and one-half days of hearings when it had announced a two-week affair. In Los Angeles, the Un-Americans met the same kind of defiance. Trade unionists, housewives and professional people are taking the offensive to rout and finish the committee. This is the growing challenge during the high tide of reaction. The ebb follows. More and more people are getting tired of being hounded and heaped with indignities. Some take courage in the growing resistance of people who refuse not only to crawl before the committee, but who fight back. They are fed up with the low congressional practice of making heroes out of stool pigeons. They have faith in the Constitution and invoke its guarantees to prevent the witch hunters from stepping into their province of legal rights. We remember the headlines of about three years ago when ten Hollywood screenwriters and directors refused to answer the Un-American Committee. They invoked the First Amendment, which guarantees freedom of speech in declaring their right to remain silent. They were convicted. Today, people speak of the Hollywood Nine because one lost courage and self-respect and went crawling to the committee because he wanted to be respectable and to feel the jingle of Hollywood dollars in his pocket. Exercise of intelligent courage made the Hollywood Nine stick to their guns. And while they served their time, they made their contribution in the struggle to outlaw the un-Americans. Close at home, here in Hawaii, the defiant 39 invoked the Fifth Amendment which guarantees one the right not to answer incriminating questions. Thirty-nine individuals were cited for contempt of Congress by the Un-American Committee, and the thirty-nine were upheld by the court on their legal stand in refusing to turn stool pigeons. But here, too, the Hawaii thirty-nine are now the thirty-eight, for one has gone crawling. Jack Kuano has become the stool pigeon, turning against his former union and joining the big bosses in attacking it. Today in places like Chicago and Los Angeles, housewives, professionals and workers find protection under the Fifth Amendment as they fight back against the un-Americans. They take courage from the fight of others who made their fight earlier. They undoubtedly appreciate the integrity and understanding of the Hollywood Nine, Hawaii 39, and others like them, and that of the early fighters for democratic processes who insisted that the Bill of Rights be spelled out long, long ago. Men of property and special privilege in the founding days of our country tried to assure the people that the right of free speech, press, and religion were implied in the Constitution. But the common people refused to accept this assurance as a guarantee and refused to ratify a constitution that did not put down these inalienable rights in black and white. Thus, the constitution says, Congress shall make no law abridging these rights. The struggle to win these provisions, the Bill of Rights, was a major event. But the Bill of Rights is not safe. For example, it is not safe as long as 16 million Negroes do not enjoy their full guarantees. They actually have not been fully established because racists and varied interest elements with power in and out of government have found it profitable to keep them from full employment. In the South, particularly, it has been made unsafe for Negroes to speak their minds and to assert their minimum rights. In Hawaii, a national Negro magazine said in a recent issue, numerous Negroes try to pass as Hawaiians. Why? Because of discrimination. When 16 million Negroes are subjected to frame-ups, persecution, lynching, discrimination in housing, education and in jobs, indignities, and what have you, the climate in the country is suitable for the un-Americans. The strategists of the un-American committees have generally been congressmen from the South. In their states, they do not need the un-American committees to harass and persecute the Negroes, and they carry their prejudices to the far corners of the country. Ever since I was indicted under the Smith Act, along with six others on August 28, 1951, I have frequently thought that the persecution of people by the use of the Smith and McCarran Acts and the harassments by the un-American committee, bad as they are, are comparatively mild when we consider what the Negroes go through in our country year in and year out. Their growing struggle for freedom and equality is a common struggle of all democratic-minded people. Representative Howard Smith of Virginia, who authorized the Smith Act, admitted that his law was aimed to get around the limitations imposed by the First Amendment, 
congressional record may nineteenth nineteen forty he is a southerner who does not believe in the bill of rights the smith act attempts to put ideas behind bars this is impossible for ideas grow out of actual conditions thus people fight for peace when they see the horrors devastation and waste in wars they realize the desirability of organization like in trade unions when they become aware that dog-eat-dog -dog competition is against their interests when they experience poverty amidst plenty chaos in the economic setup and depressions they begin to think of social planning the smith act is actually a plot to overthrow the constitution of the united states representative smith admits that thomas jefferson would not be safe today in his first inaugural address president jefferson said if there be any among us who wish to dissolve this union or to change its republican form let them stand undisturbed as monuments of the safety with which error of opinion may be tolerated where reason is left free to combat it people cannot say the same today the spirit of the times has changed but this is not a permanent situation in about three weeks the smith act trial here will get under way more than a year has passed since our indictment and as i look back i see that the smith act case brought a favorable change to hawaii the jury which indicted us and the jury list from which it was chosen were predominantly howley and people classed as tied up with big employers the non howley particularly the people of japanese ancestry were underrepresented and so were the workers in the major industries the government prosecutors who are pushing the smith act case fought for the unrepresentative jury list and federal judge j frank mclaughlin stood four square behind that jury list who's fighting for democratic processes and constitutional rights today even the big five lawyers claim the former grand jury was not valid that it did not represent a cross-section of the community they put forth this argument in a current tax suit the old jury list is gone and the present one is more representative here the smith act defense has brought a constructive improvement in the federal court system decent and fair-minded howley prefer this change the advocates of the smith act want a howley boss jury system thus the people fight for decency equality and self-respect it may sound paradoxical when i say that i am consciously participating in the struggle of our generation to wipe away a great part of the conditions that have shaped my thinking the path i travelled not of my own choosing was full of inequities the poverty of the coffee farm tenancy in kona and the depression that affected our lives raised many probing questions in my mind just as it must have in the minds of others at first my questions were simple and very personal why must we suffer why can't everyone live like the bosses then the questions took a more meaningful form must we have recurrent depressions why can't there be permanent prosperity in like manner when i began to work for wages i asked myself why does my employer pay so little why must we work for almost nothing how can we get equitable wages will i be fired if i ask for more would it be fair to do so will others join me in making the demand these were natural reactions to the conditions in society as i found them there came a time when i began to look for the correction of inequities i can see nothing wrong in this my contention has always been through the study of history that only a terribly weak corrupt oppressive and incompetent government lacking the confidence of popular support for its programs fears active minds ideas and the questions raised by the populace if a government is doing what is right and just for humanity there is no reason to frighten people into silence thus stopping the free flow of ideas we are a sick nation today with a stagnation of the minds in this land of democratic traditions people are afraid to talk as the bill of rights and the constitution are shoved aside by the taft hartley law the mccarran subversive control law and the smith act those who continue to speak out are arrested and placed behind bars but ideas cannot be locked away in such a simple manner for the very conditions in our society give birth to them in the minds of men since the time i left hawaii in nineteen forty i have constantly looked for a solution to the abject poverty of farmers in many lands when i saw india in nineteen forty four i recalled the time the reverend caldwell took me into the backwoods of georgia to visit the sharecroppers in a recurrent famine indians were dying in the streets and i measured the livelihood of the common people for instance in terms of the fuel they used in a modern city like calcutta many people burned cow dung for cooking and as we went on hikes we saw pancake dung pasted on house walls and trees to dry and in chum king i often saw children in rags with baskets digging holes under a bamboo fence of a rich man's residence trying to gather fuel by getting twigs and dried leaves fallen to the ground from shade trees inside the compound and everywhere i went i saw the tobacco road of poverty my experiences have influenced me to participate in the fight for equality for all people as written in the constitution of our nation where the ruling class tries hard to prevent fundamental social changes revolutionary in nature from taking place gradually i wondered when by its very resistance it would help create a force powerful enough to bring the change 
for it is axiomatic that counter-revolutionary activities and force fighting the change for the better would cause resistance and forge a revolutionary people who would proceed to improve conditions with greater zeal in times like these it is dangerous to speak out but to be silenced means to go back on all one's teachings from childhood it means going against the dictates of one's own conscience a note on the text koji ariyoshi wrote and published the articles which make up this narrative between the thirteenth of september nineteen fifty one shortly after the arrest and the twenty third of october nineteen fifty two he incorporated much of the material from a book he had written about his army experiences in china the book was cancelled by the publisher, Raynal and Hitchcock, in the developing Cold War climate of 1947,1948. Appearing weekly for over a year, these articles present a challenge to the editor. Some segments of the weekly columns in the Honolulu record have been eliminated to avoid repetition, to provide continuity, and to keep the focus on Ariyoshi's story of his life. The afterword includes some of these segments, and specifically those which reflect his views on the current 1952 political scene and contain his comments on the Un-American Committee and Smith Act trials. For those wishing to consult the original record version, the articles appearing in each chapter are listed below. Obvious typos in the record have been silently corrected. The spelling and punctuation have been retained, unless they make the sense or emphasis of the passage unclear. Hawaiian diacritical marks have not been added to the record material translated into chinese by chen hui chen ziubia and shu zhang portions of this manuscript appeared as yaoji zinjai huyulu published in nineteen ninety nine as part of the guoji yorinkan shu series by jongxi jiaoyu chubanch jongxi educational publishing in nineteen seventy eight the u s china people's friendship association published remembering koji ariyoshi an american g i in yanan edited by hu dean which contained excerpts from the columns dealing with ariyoshi's experiences in china